March 1945, Fusa Airfield, outside Tokyo. A captured American fighter sits under hangar lights, its blue skin scraped, its star insignias roughly painted over. To the men surrounding it, it looks almost wrong. The wings are too smooth, the radiator scoop under the belly looks too small, and the nose, long, delicate, doesn't look like a brawler. A few mechanics actually smile. One mutters, half-joking, that the Americans built a racer, not a war machine. Then they unlatch the cowling, and the laughter dies. Because inside the Mustang isn't a fragile engine. It's a system designed like a trap, not one secret part, but a chain of secrets that only works when an entire industry is behind it. The question that follows them for weeks is simple and terrifying. What was the hidden engine trick inside the P-51 that Japan could understand but still couldn't build? The P-51 Mustang had a strange reputation even among enemies. From a distance, it didn't look like the loud, thick-skinned brutes Japan expected from American factories. It looked clean, almost elegant. Japanese maintenance crews were used to fighters that wore their strength on the outside. Tight cowls, compact noses, tough airframes built to survive imperfect fuel, rough runways, desperate repairs. Their best late-war machines were fast and lethal, but also sensitive. Engines could lose power from bad fuel, superchargers could fail. Parts could be inconsistent. So when the Mustang arrived in pieces, then later, in at least one case, nearly intact, there was a natural reaction. Confidence. Not arrogance. Not ignorance. Confidence. Liquid-cooled engines, some mechanics believed, are too fragile for combat. One lucky puncture and the coolant is gone. The engine overheats. The fighter dies. And the Mustang's belly scoop? That looked like drag, a big mouth under the aircraft, swallowing air, wasting speed. Japanese engineers were trained to fear unnecessary drag the way pilots fear fire. There was another reason for the laughter. War had conditioned them to judge aircraft by what they could build. If you had never manufactured perfect sheet metal in massive panels, you learned to distrust thin skins. If you couldn't guarantee uniform alloys, you learned to keep designs simpler. If your factories were bombed and your fuel was degraded, you learned to tolerate leaks, vibration, roughness. The Mustang looked like a machine that demanded perfection. And that's why, at first glance, some of them dismissed it because a machine that demands perfection is supposed to fail in war. But then they began to measure it. They ran fingertips along panel seams. They checked the rivet lines. They looked at how cleanly components fit, like they belonged together before a single screw was tightened. They didn't see fragility. They saw an aircraft built like a promise. If every part is made correctly, the whole machine becomes unfair. And the unfairness was exactly what they had been fighting in the sky. Mustangs arriving with bombers, staying with them for hours, and still having energy to hunt on the way home. So the laughter changed into something else. Not fear. Calculation. When the cowling opened, the first shock was not complexity. It was order. Japanese radial engines were powerful, compact, air-cooled, mechanically straightforward in concept. A liquid-cooled V12, by comparison, looked like a snake pit. Pipes, pumps, coolant lines, radiators, clamps, more ways to fail. But this V12 wasn't busy. It was arranged like a factory line inside the aircraft, each subsystem sitting where it belonged, each hose routed with intention each connection designed to be repeated thousands of times. The Merlin family engine, built in America under license, had a reputation for something Japan desperately needed but could rarely guarantee by 1945, consistent high power at altitude. 
And this is where the P-51 stopped being a beautiful airframe and became a trap. At altitude, air becomes thin. Thin air means less oxygen. Less oxygen means less power. Every fighter in the world fights this problem. Some engines brute force it with larger displacement. Others rely on superchargers, compressors that shove more air into the cylinders. Japan had superchargers, Germany had superchargers, America had superchargers. But the Mustang's Merlin-powered setup made the altitude problem feel solved, like a math equation that kept giving the same answer, power, power, power. The trick begins with how the air is treated. Compressing air heats it. Hotter air is less dense and it's more likely to cause detonation, violent premature combustion that can destroy an engine. So if you want high boost at altitude, you need compression and cooling. The Merlin solution used advanced supercharging and charge cooling, an integrated method to keep the engine breathing hard without tearing itself apart. The Japanese engineers didn't need to be told what that meant. They could read it in the metal. They could see the logic in the castings. They could see why this engine could fight high above the weather, where many Japanese fighters struggled to climb and crews struggled to breathe. And they could also see the price. Every tight-fitting component implied machine tools precise enough to reproduce it. Every clean mating surface implied quality control strict enough. The belly scoop looked like drag until they realized it was doing something almost unfair. Every fighter needs cooling. Engines wake heat. Heat must go somewhere. That somewhere is usually a radiator, air flowing through a hot matrix carrying heat away. Radiators, in simple terms, cost speed. They create drag. They waste energy. But the Mustang's radiator installation wasn't just a radiator. It was a duct a channel, a shaped tunnel that didn't simply accept drag. It tried to turn that drag into motion. Here's the deadly elegance. Air enters the scoop. It slows, compresses, and passes through the radiator. Inside, it heats up, gaining energy. Then, as it exits through a carefully shaped outlet, it accelerates backward. And any time you accelerate air backward, the airplane gets a tiny push forward. It's not a rocket. It's not magic. It's just the cruel truth of physics, used correctly. Cooling becomes less of a penalty and closer to a trade. The Mustang didn't merely reduce radiator drag. It made cooling part of its speed. Japanese engineers had seen clever radiator work before. They knew about streamlined housings. They knew how important drag was. But the Mustang's duct looked like it belonged to an aircraft that had been wind tunnel tested until the data surrendered. And that's the second part of the trick, because to build a duct at works, you don't just need a blueprint. You need the testing culture that proves the blueprint works. They examined the outlet. They looked at how it could be adjusted. They followed the duct path. They noted how the system sat along the center line, balanced, efficient, married to the aircraft's aerodynamics. Suddenly, the belly scoop didn't look like drag. It looked like a quiet engine, one that didn't burn fuel, but still gave something back. And now the hangar's original joke sounded foolish, because the Mustang wasn't fragile. It was optimized. But optimization is a luxury. There is a moment in engineering, always the same moment, when admiration becomes despair. It happens when you realize that design is not the hardest part. The hardest part is repeatability. Japan could build excellent aircraft. It could build brilliant prototypes. It could build fighters that, in the hands of aces, were terrifying. But by late war, the question was never, can we build one? The question was, can we build one exactly like the last one, again and again, under pressure? The Mustang demanded a chain of conditions. High-grade aluminum and consistent alloys, so the airframe stayed light without cracking. 
reliable manufacturing tolerances so panels stayed smooth and drag stayed low, specialized materials in engine components that lived in heat, bearings, valve train parts, seals that didn't degrade, wiring in components that behaved predictably, not almost predictably. And then there was fuel. The Merlin's performance wasn't only about mechanical genius, it was about what it drank. High-performance supercharged engines want high-octane fuel. Without it, you cannot safely run high boost. Without it, you detonate, you lose power, you destroy engines. Japan's fuel situation was collapsing. Even when good fuel existed, consistency was the enemy and an engine like this is not forgiving of inconsistency. It became painfully clear you could copy the shape, but not the operating envelope. And that's when the Mustang revealed its final insult. The aircraft wasn't built around one miracle component, it was built around a philosophy. Design for mass manufacturing, then let the industry multiply it. That philosophy required machine tools, factories that built the machines that built the parts. It required... Range is not glamorous. It doesn't explode, it doesn't roar, it doesn't create a single dramatic kill. Range just stays. The Mustang's greatest strategic sin was that it could escort bombers deep, stay with them, fight, and still bring a pilot home. In practical terms, this meant American bombers were no longer temporary visitors. They became routine. For Japan, routine was death. A defending air force can survive raids. It can concentrate. It can respond. But when the attacker can bring protection across the entire route, when escort fighters don't run out of legs halfway, every defensive calculation collapses. The Mustang wasn't just fast. It was persistent and persistence is what breaks a war economy. It forces constant scrambling, constant fuel usage, constant wear, constant pilot fatigue. It turns air defense into attacks that never stops. So when engineers in that hangar studied the P-51, they weren't only studying how it flew, they were studying why it kept coming back. We return to the question from the hangar. What was the hidden engine trick inside the P-51 that Japan could understand but still couldn't build? The answer is brutal. The trick was not one secret part. It was the integration of power, cooling, and manufacturing so tightly linked that removing any one piece broke the whole advantage. The Marlin gave altitude power. The cooling duct reduced the penalty of speed. The airframe demanded smooth precision. And the system only worked because an industrial network could reproduce it again and again without improvisation. Japan could study the Mustang. It could fly it. 